So uh, we had a spot open up in our programming uh, uh, two days ago, uh, so that was a little bit uh, tight, uh, but I thought it would be a good opportunity to take a look at what we've been finding in the John Gruber collection so far. And this was also a convenient thing to do since I had already put together a draft of this presentation to share with our staff a few weeks ago. Um, still, I hadn't planned on having this ready for primetime viewing quite so quickly. Uh, I'm grateful to Haley who helped me with some cleanup work in Photoshop and uh, just yesterday on that in fact, and also three of our board members who helped ID some photo locations where I needed some more details. Uh, bon French, Todd Halamka, and Norm Carlson all answered some questions for me. Uh, and with that, I will also add that any mistakes that persist here are entirely my fault. Um, now, as Adrian mentioned, uh, John arranged his photography chronologically. Uh, and that's also how we're processing it, beginning with the oldest material and working our way forward in time. Uh, our intern, Abigail, is currently uh, working in 1965. Uh, so I'll be sharing selections here from 1960 through 64. Uh, why am I starting in 60? Well, uh, John took his first photographs in 1948 when he was just 12. He shot quite a bit during his high school and college years in the 50s, uh, but it was really right around 1960 that he came into his own as a photographer and his work really blossomed from there going forward. He studied journalism at the University of Wisconsin and he closely followed the newspaper photojournalism of uh, Madison and Milwaukee, uh, which had a very dynamic and vibrant scene then. Uh, John was particularly drawn to the work of Dick Sroda at the Wisconsin State Journal and Jim Stanfield at the Milwaukee Journal. Uh, looking at them and others, uh, John brought a photojournalistic approach to his railroad photography, both in his style and also in his volume of shooting. Uh, he averaged more than 100 rolls per year in the early 1960s, and to date we've digitized more than 15,000 of those negatives. Today we're going to look at 93 of those shots. Uh, they're some of my favorites, but I easily could have pulled several other selections with just as many images that are just as good. Let's see here. Uh, so one of the many ways that John applied that photojournalistic approach to railroad photography was by adapting a project-based methodology. And I'll say a little bit more about that as we get into the photographs. Uh, he had at least six main projects in the early 1960s. Uh, those would be his local railroads here in southern Wisconsin, a little operation up in Minnesota called the Duluth and Northeastern, the Burlington Steam Excursions, the Rio Grande Narrow Gauge, the Electric Interurban Chicago North Shore Milwaukee, and finally Chicago Union Station. Now he shot other subjects in addition to these, uh, but I'd say that these six account for three quarters of his negatives for the first half of the 1960s. Being able to dig through those negatives uh, that our interns have been digitizing was a real revelation for me. I always knew that John was a great photographer, but despite working closely with him for a decade, I had only seen a tiny bit of his photography. All the projects that we worked on together focused on other photographers and other artists' work. Now, I still admire John's selflessness in that, but it's exciting for me to finally be able to shine a well-deserved spotlight on more of his work. As I said before, I am so grateful to our collections team for making that possible, as well as to John's widow, Bonnie, who not only entrusted us with his collection, but spent two years organizing and preparing it for us. Um, now, I should also mention here that we have not yet come across any decent photographs of John out in the field in the 60s, so this and the previous portrait uh, both show him in the 1980s, and they come thanks to Jeff Browse. So thanks, Jeff, for sending these along. So we'll start our tour of John's work today with the local scene in southern Wisconsin, where John spent a lot of time on the Chicago and Northwestern and the Milwaukee road lines in and around his hometown of Madison. Now, this is some project-based photography that I think all of us can relate to. Taking advantage of your knowledge and proximity of your local railroads to photograph them well and taking advantage of all the special things and weather that might happen. We've already seen a great example of that today in Jen uh, Albake's fine work in New England. This is the first photograph we'll see. It's the Milwaukee Road Depot in Madison. It's also the oldest photograph I'll show today. Uh, this was taken by John on Groundhog Day in 1956 when he was a 19 year old sophomore at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, we have here train 106 preparing to depart on its midday run to Milwaukee where it made a connection with the morning Hiawatha coming in from the Twin Cities and heading to Chicago. The road in the foreground is West Washington Avenue, and that was still protected by an elevated crossing tower at this time, and that tower gave John the elevation he used for this photograph. 
The depot still stands and the Wisconsin and Southern still operates on this route today, but only one track remains. Uh, the yard and the shops there at left are all long gone. John took this photograph with one of the many uh, medium format cameras he used in his early work. Uh, this is a two and a quarter by three and a quarter negative. And even though it's bigger than his 35 millimeter uh, that he shot later, you can see it's not terribly sharp. Uh, Haley Page uh, recently uh, visited this scene for her rail trails project. And so we can see a contemporary view here of the Madison Depot. And we do still have a Milwaukee Road E unit sitting there, uh, but there's only the one active track remaining. And of course, all those yard tracks on the left are long gone. Getting back to John's work, uh, right around 1960, he got a Nikon F camera. And with that, he had found his Excalibur. Uh, when I met him in 2004, he was still shooting with it, uh, along with a couple of other Nikon bodies he had picked up over the years. Uh, this shot is September 1st of 1960. We're still in Madison. That's the state capitol in the background. And this is Milwaukee Road train 118, the Varsity, which made an afternoon run to Chicago. It's crossing a causeway here that separates Monona Bay from Lake Monona. And the woman in the foreground appears to be trying to unsubmerge her boat dock. Uh, if you look behind the last car of the train, you might see the signal there, and that protects the Milwaukee Roads Diamond with the Chicago and Northwestern, which was located on those causeways in the middle of the lake, a very unique railroad location. It's also worth noting that at this time, both the Milwaukee Road and the Northwestern ran two pairs of passenger trains daily between Madison and Chicago, in addition to services going elsewhere. And here's the varsity again going the other way. Way on a winter morning in 1963. Uh, this is a telephoto view that really emphasizes the state capitol, and I can attest that Madison's skyline has changed quite a bit in the past 58 years since John took this photograph. Now, I mentioned the diamond in the lake with the Northwestern, and here we have a better view of it. This is the varsity again, heading south for Chicago in a view that looks south down the Northwestern tracks. Uh, that's timetabled east for both of those railroads. Uh, remarkably, both of these lines still remain in service today as part of the Wisconsin and Southern, and this spot has become one of my favorite places for drone photography here in Madison. Uh, sadly, though, we don't have any passenger trains, and the Wisconsin and Southern only comes through here a couple of times a day. Now, just northeast of that diamond in the lake, the Milwaukee and the Northwestern tracks ran parallel, a uh, two-per railroad, along the southeastern edge of the Madison Isthmus. You can see the causeways where the diamond is located in the background uh, left of center. Now that's Lake Monona on the left, and the state capitol building would be a couple of blocks to the right of this view. This is a northwestern freight train heading for their yard on the east side of town, and that's John Nolan Drive just to the left of it. Uh, where, jo where John is standing today uh, is the site of Monona Terrace, uh, which straddles the one track that still runs here. Now, after running parallel along the Isthmus, uh, the Milwaukee and the Northwestern crossed again at the eastern tip of downtown in the middle of Blair Street. Uh, this wonderfully moody view on a rainy evening looks up Wilson Street towards the Capitol Square. Lake Monona would be just out of view to the left. And this is a shot of a Milwaukee Road switch job coming back from serving customers to the south with one of their distinctive Fairbanks Morse switchers. And here's the reverse perspective on that same scene, taken catty corner to the last image on another rainy evening in 1961. Uh, this view looks east down Williamson Street. And that's Chicago's uh, Northwestern's evening train uh, to Chicago, number 508. It left Madison at 7.30 and arrived in the Windy City at 10.59 PM. Uh, you can see a corner of the Northwestern Depot there on the left. Uh, the depot still stands, but without the platforms, it's really quite hard to recognize it as a former train station these days. Let's get out of Madison for a few shots and then come back to it. Uh, about 15 miles northwest of town, the Northwestern crosses the Wisconsin River on this beautiful pile of steel girders and trusses. This wide spot in the river is known as Lake Wisconsin, and it's formed by a dam located downstream in John's childhood home of Prairie de Sac. He recorded this westbound Northwestern freight train on a dark and gloomy day in December of 1959. I think it's one of his first shots with his Nikon F, which had just debuted in April of that same year. The following month, John was in Elroy, Wisconsin for the afternoon passing of the crack passenger trains on this line the Northwestern Streamline Dakota 400s. At the time, they ran between Chicago and Rapid City, South Dakota, 
although later that year, the Northwestern cut them back to Mankato, Minnesota, and renamed them the Rochester 400s. They were scheduled to pass every afternoon in Elroy just before 4 p.m., and that made this a favorite spot for John to photograph. I love the view here of the steam from the heating lines enveloping the conductor on the platform. In November of the next year, 1961, John caught the two trains meeting in Elroy, and what a lovely shot this is. I'm just gonna leave it up on the screen for a moment for us to admire and take a drink. Now we're gonna jump back to the Milwaukee Road now in another view from 1961. And as a certified Mississippi River rat, uh, this is a location with great significance for me. We're looking down the river from US Highway 12 uh, on the bridge that connects Prairie to Sheen, Wisconsin with Marquette, Iowa. And here we have a Milwaukee Road local freight heading east into Wisconsin over a pontoon bridge. The last three cars of the train are on a floating pontoon span that was the railroad's rather unique solution to keeping the river open to navigation here. Uh, just to the right of the train, you can see the, the stack and a whiff of smoke from the little steamboat that stayed here to open and close the bridge. The Milwaukee actually had two pontoon bridges over the Mississippi at one time. The other was way upstream between Reed's Landing, Minnesota and Trevino, Wisconsin on a branch line to Eau Claire. That one closed in 1952 but this one lasted until 1961, and John called it here in its final months of operation. Now, I've made uh, dozens of trips to the Mississippi River since moving to Wisconsin 10 years ago, and I knew that John had photographed this bridge, so I was pretty excited when we got to these negatives in his collection. Uh, back to the Milwaukee Road main line across the state, we come to one of John's better known photographs, uh, which he took just uh, two weeks after the prior shot. On a June afternoon in 1961, the Milwaukee Road's nameless local train number 58 bears down on the tunnel in aptly named Tunnel City, Wisconsin, in the middle of its all-day 421-mile trek from Chicago to Minneapolis. The Hiawatha Streamliners made that run in about six hours, but with so many more stops on its route, the local took more than 12 hours. Now this, of course, is the cover shot in John's remarkable movie-like sequence that ran in the November 1961 issue of Trains Magazine. Now, I should say here that many of us, with our tongues firmly in our cheeks, like to say that John invented the telephoto lens with this photograph. I know he had a 200 millimeter lens at some point, but here I think he may have actually used an 85 millimeter, and he just cropped the heck out of it. Now, that was a daring decision by John to print it like this, and a daring decision by Trains editor David Morgan to run it. And here we are still talking about it 60 years later, 60 years to the month actually of uh, the cover of this issue. And I should add too that anytime this shot came up in conversation with John, he always said he thought it looked better with the Trains banner up there at the top of it. On the same day, he took another tele of telephoto shot here that I happen to like even better, even if it isn't quite as iconic as the last one. From atop the tunnel, John looked west across the rolling hills of Wisconsin's driftless area, a region untouched by the glaciers of the last ice age, as the combined afternoon Hiawatha and Olympian Hiawatha sped west into the hazy distance, bound for Minneapolis and ultimately Tacoma, Washington. John made countless trips as well to Milwaukee, and this view from February 4th, 1961, blows my mind every time I see it. It's a simple scene. The conductor walking down the platform framed by two trains at the end of the shed. But what a powerful image, study in light, lines, and contrast. And there's a loneliness to this image too, one that evokes so many of the prevailing notions about railroads in general and passenger trains in particular in the 1960s. We'll close this section by returning to Madison for a few more views along similar lines. Here we have Northwestern train 508 again, the evening run to Chicago approaching the diamond in the lake with the Milwaukee Road, the state capitol looming large in the distance of this telephoto shot. And John seemed to make a point of shooting this train at twilight in the long days around the summer solstice. He took this one on July 3rd of 1962. Eight months later, he made perhaps his greatest photograph of Madison passenger trains, the eastbound Rochester 400 approaching the station on a foggy March evening in 1963. This was John at his atmospheric best, using just the lights of the train in the station and a handheld shot with heavy push processing 
and careful printing. While this shot is firmly rooted in time and place, to me, it is also a transcendent photograph, one that speaks to the allure of train travel everywhere for all time. Sadly, time was running out for the Chicago and Northwestern passenger service in Madison. Just four months later, on July 23rd, John photographed the very last day of Northwestern passenger operations in Wisconsin's capital city. This is train 519, the westbound Rochester 400, which attracted a crowd of news reporters and others during a 25 minute layover on its very last westbound trip. John took dozens of photographs during that stop and this is the one that he most frequently used to summarize the event. A grateful passenger offering a farewell handshake to the, part, to the departing conductor. It's a fleeting moment, never to be repeated, perfectly composed and captured for all time. Now the next project we're going to see is the Duluth and Northeastern. Having lived in Madison for a decade now, I've learned enough about the local railroad scene to speak about it with at least some knowledge, but that was not the case for the Duluth and Northeastern, so bear with me. Uh, this was a little railroad based in the mill town of Cloquet, Minnesota, and I had to start by looking up just where exactly that is. And here we are about 15 miles west of Duluth and about 350 miles northwest of Madison. Now that might seem like a long way for a photography project in the pre-interstate highway era, but John had good reason to make frequent trips to this part of the world. He married Bonnie Jean Barstow in 1962, and her parents lived in Superior, Wisconsin, uh, right across the river from Duluth. The twin ports of Duluth and Superior offer a fascinating panoply of railroading, but for all his visits to the region in the early 1960s, John photographed his photography almost entirely on the little Duluth and Northeastern. In 1962 and 1963, he shot it on at least 11 different days, spending no fewer than nine separate trips from Madison. He did most of his photography right in Cloquet, which nestles up to the southern bank of the St. Louis River. Uh, the Great Northern Railway followed that southern bank, and the Duluth and Northeastern connected to it on the northeastern edge of town. Uh, the Duluth and Northeastern tracks head west, uh, then they crossed the river via Dunlop Island with a bridge on either end and then head north into timber country up the river on the other side from the Great Northern. And you can see also the red line on uh, State Highway 33, also known as Sunnyside Drive in Cloquet. It also crosses the island as well as the railroad and it provided some excellent vantage points for John to photograph from. Now, I think what initially drew John to the Duluth and Northeastern was the fact that it was still operating with a, a full roster of steam locomotives in the early 1960s, years after almost every other railroad in the US and Canada had converted to diesel power. Uh, this is 280 number 16 in Cloquet in uh, early January of 1962, beautifully framed by the cars, trucks, mill buildings, and an old passenger coach. Now, while I think the steam engines were the initial draw, I think it was the people that kept John coming back. The veteran railroaders of the Duluth and Northeastern seemed to have taken a shine to the young, soft-spoken photographer from Madison. And John seemed to enjoy full access on his many visits to the Duluth and Northeastern. Here he documents the crew fixing lunch over the potbelly stove in the caboose in this wonderfully intimate portrait. Now, how many of us would have kept trading the four docks of Duluth and Superior to keep coming back to the little short line railroad? John did, time and again, for at least two solid years. And in doing so, I think he created an exceptional record of old school railroading in the, Minnesota, in the Minnesota forests. And on this little short line, he also created some photographs that remain emblematic of the entire railroad industry. This one, a perfect silhouette of 280 number 16 on the bitterly cold day of January 26th, 1962, became an icon for the center. John used it on the cover of the first issue of our journal, Railroad Heritage, published in 2000. John also noted that the scene here changed so quickly that he only had time to fire off two shots on his Nikon. His friend and frequent traveling companion, Joe Swanson, was with him on this day. And every time he tells me about that experience, John, Joe says of this shot, I was there, but I didn't see it. John did. In another iconic shot, John focuses on a brakeman or conductor giving hand signals to the engineer while switching. 
And here's the northernmost of those two bridges leading on and off Dunlap Island uh, with the train going south onto the island in a beautiful backlit broadside perspective. This was uh, November 24th, 1962. The next spring, John was back in April and he made a wonderful pan shot with the 28 steaming through a rural road crossing uh, with both the fireman and the head brakeman looking out from the cab window. He caught more of the crew in this candid view of them performing switching duties that same day off of the caboose with the engine in the distance. And then one of my favorite shots of the Duluth and Northeastern, the scene that could be straight out of an issue of Life magazine. John is looking west from the Route 33 bridge on Dunlap Island. And that's the Broadway Street Bridge at lower left crossing the southern channel of the St. Louis River with the mill and cloquet and the distance beyond it. Now, just right at center, the Northeastern Hotel advertises liquors and food on its second floor uh, uh, wall, where a lone pedestrian walks beneath the awning on the sidewalk. The patterns of this shot are breathtaking to me, from the automobiles to the storefronts to the freight cars with their shadows falling perfectly into the street under the early spring sun as puppy clouds drift in off the prairies to the west. Another moment in time captured perfectly by John. His next visit was in July of 1963, and he was able to go inside the shop for a dramatic Ring of Fire series of images. The workers here are using gas to heat a driving wheel tire. John's notes said they were replacing the tire, and that generated quite a bit of discussion when we recently shared this image on our social media sites as part of our Worker Wednesday series. If they were actually replacing the tire, you'd think they probably would have at least disconnected the side rod and maybe even remove the wheel entirely. Howard Pincus offered what, most seems, what seems like the most logical explanation to me, saying that the workers were probably heating this tire to adjust it on the wheel rather than replacing it. In any case, it is a dramatic and eye-catching series of photographs made possible by the great relationship John had built up with the railroaders in Cloquet. In November of 1963, he made another iconic view of steam railroading there with this shot of a fireman watering the 27 in a composition that looks simple at first, but is actually deceptively complex with the many shapes, lines, and the utterly superb contrast. We saw the northern bridge off Dunlap Island earlier, and here's the southern span. John was looking east from Route 33, and I'm guessing that the wooden trestle had a weight restriction that allowed only one locomotive to cross at a time. The second engine clearly had its work cut out for it with that long string, string of gondolas loaded with pulp wood. And here's the Northern Bridge again on the same November day as the last shot. We saw a river level view of this bridge earlier and here John is standing up on the Route 33 embankment. He's once again used backlighting to great advantage as the number 16 steams south onto the island with Caboose where another engine is simmering off in the distance just beyond le the left end of the bridge. John's exceptional skills at composition are on display here again. He's perfectly positioned the mill stack at dead center, and then he's used the rule of thirds to divide the view from top to bottom. And he waited until the precise moment when the locomotive and caboose were, silhouette, were silhouetted just perfectly against the shimmering river. And we'll conclude this glimpse of the Duluth and Northeastern with a night shot of 280 number 28 simmering away at a grade crossing two days before Christmas in 1963. Regular steam operations ended the following year and John began to turn his cameras elsewhere when he visited the Twin Ports. For bigger steam operations in the 1960s, there were numerous mainline excursions and John photographed many of them. For both proximity and frequency, he favored the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy which ran excursions all over its system in the late 1950s and well into the 1960s, primarily using two locomotives, 282 number 4960 and 484 number 5632. Uh, from 1957 through 1964, John photographed no fewer than 24 different Burlington steam excursions. This is the first one we have on record. Uh, this photograph was taken September 1st, 1957, and it shows a 464 number 3003 leading a trip from Chicago to Galesburg, uh, Illinois, uh, running via Savannah and seen here at Barstow. This engine's now on display in Galesburg. 
Let's take a moment though to remind ourselves of the prevailing rail fan aesthetics when it comes to photographing steam excursions. You wanna shoot on sunny days with the sun at your back and the train coming towards you, making sure to use a shutter speed fast enough to freeze the action. And by all means, please do not include any other people in your shot. Now, if you'd like to get a good buzz going in the next few minutes, grab a beverage of choice and take a drink every time John breaks one of those rules. <laughs> Actually, I don't advise that. Uh, you might not be feeling very good. But on a somewhat more serious note, the point I want to make is that John didn't try to recreate the past with his photographs of steam excursions. He fully embraced what they meant in the present. And in doing so, I think he created a visual record that carries with it some of the excitement and wonder of these trips in the late 50s and early 60s. On December 18th, 1960, he was aboard a trip from Chicago to Galesburg leading out the Dutch door with the cold Illinois wind in his face to record not a shot of the locomotive on a curve, but a gaggle of photographers perfectly silhouetted on the New York Central overpass at Zeering, Illinois. On a raw April day in 1961, the 4960 led a trip from Chicago to Rockford, where it went for a spin on the turntable. While most fans crowded the pit, John sought elevation to take in the whole scene. And he wasn't afraid to turn his camera back on the other photographers either. This was taken on a 1961 trip up the Mississippi River to St. Paul and what a remarkable view of rail fan fashion and camera gear of the early 1960s. If you recognize anyone in this shot, please let us know. We'd love to find out. On the same day at Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, John recorded several of the local kids admiring 5632 including uh, what appears to be a brother and sister holding hands next to a cylinder of that big O2 locomotive. On December 17th, he made this cab portrait of young and old steam fans in the 4960, uh, which was not the only thing smoking in this photograph. Uh, with snow covering the ground on April 1st, 1962, John crouched low and used a low shutter speed for a dramatic going away shot of a double-headed excursion at Mendota, Illinois. And then in September, he took this great view of four boys covering their ears for the 5632 during a trip from Chicago to Minneapolis. That kind of reminds me of myself at that age, actually. I love steam locomotives that hated loud noises, and sometimes my mom would actually stand behind me and put her hands over my hands covering my ears. On the same weekend at Crawford Tower, just south of Prairie du Chien, John intentionally set up behind the photo line and used the photographers to frame the scene of the train passing the tower. That December, on a Christmas trip to Rockford, John took one of my favorite photographs of a Burlington steam excursion, this backlit broadside view of the 4960, rolling its short train through the stubble of the harvested Illinois cornfields. More poetry here. On a trip down the Mississippi River in October of 1963, John waited on the Burlington's old passenger main line in La Crosse. After the train passed, he turned around and made this magical view of three boys with their bikes, watching it steam off into the distance. The next spring, in the darkness and fog of April 19th, 1964, John made an incredible night shot at Aurora of that day's excursion train to Savannah. A frame print of this scene hung in the upstairs hallway of John's home, and I always made a point of stopping to admire it there whenever I visited. Much as I like that one shot, this one from that October trip in 1963 might be my all-time favorite of a Burlington steam excursion. The low autumn sunlight sparkles on the wide Mississippi in its broad valley south of La Crosse, where the 5632 can stretch her legs on the straight and flat main line. She was running fast as John and his driver struggled to keep up on parallel State Highway 35. With a low shutter speed and a steady hand, John captured an image that to me is nothing short of sublime. Who could have known then this would all end in just two years and that the 5632 would be scrapped in less than a decade? Here, in this moment, you'd think she could have run forever. Now, while the mighty 5632 may have fallen, our next, our next subject is an underdog that survives. It's also the one exception to John's otherwise close to home approach to photography. For in 1961, he succumbed to an illness that has afflicted 
many railroad photographers, narrow gauge fever. While traveling cross country on October 3rd, 1961, John caught up with a Rio Grande freight train leaving Chama, New Mexico in the late afternoon. Naturally, he gave chase. And naturally, he eschewed the rules of traditional photography and shot straight into the setting sun for this dramatic view of the pusher locomotive. Just up the line at one of the road crossings leading up to Cumbres Pass, John took a pair of shots showing the head end of the pusher. While the sun had just dropped behind the ridge here, he used that to his advantage to heighten the silhouette effect against the still sunlit mountain sides across Wolf Creek. And I'd sure like to know the story of that old car on the right in these photographs. Even after that, John didn't quit. Who else but John Gruber would even attempt to shoot straight into the setting sun to silhouette a black locomotive against a black mountain? I'll admit this negative is a bit of a mess and I don't know whether John ever tried to print it, but with digital processing, we can appreciate at least some of the allure that John must have felt for the narrow gauge. He would return many times. We haven't processed the negatives from all those trips yet, but here are a few more highlights of what we've done so far. John's next trip was on his 26th birthday, on May 18, 1962, where he visited the Roundhouse in Durango, Colorado and recorded three classes of 282 locomotives awaiting their next assignments. He was back in August of that same year and he made a wonderful portrait of a fireman leaning out the window of this K-28 locomotive. On the following day, August 27th, 1962, John made another great worker shot, this one filling the stand dome. Uh, this is back in Chama and this is for a train getting ready to head east over Cumbres Pass. It took two trips to get the train up to 4% grade. This is the first run of the day with engines pulling and pushing towards the summit over those puffy cumulus clouds so typical of summer afternoons in the high country. On the second run, John went for broke. He climbed to the narrow ledge of Windy Point where he looked down into the Wolf Creek Valley on a majestic mountain scene in the low afternoon sun. Two engines struggle to heft 11 tank cars up the grade, approaching the road crossing as the shadows grow long and emotions run high. John ultimately made his greatest mark in railroad photography by focusing on people but he could certainly make a stunning landscape shot when he wanted to. He was back two months later in October when he caught up with another narrow gauge train, this time on the weed grown dual gauge track between Alamosa and Antonito, Colorado. He chased this train all the way west to Cumbres Pass, seen here near the end of the day at the horseshoe curve approaching the Los Pinos water tower. And then on the same evening, he took this. And this shot just slays me. Uh, yes, it's technically flawed and it might be short on detail and emotion, but it, uh, detail and information, but it sure goes long on emotion. And I was thinking of this shot when Stacy was mentioning earlier how she's uh, been willing to let go of some of her quest for sharpness. Uh, I think the emotional trade off here is well worth it. Many railroad enthusiasts have photographed the Rio Grande narrow gauge, and many have come to yearn for it. John managed to photograph that yearning in this image. Who else but John Gruber would even see this shot, let alone try it. Now from the mountains of Colorado and New Mexico, we're now going to the cities and towns of Lake Michigan's North Shore. And if you know much at all about John's photography, you probably know that he covered the final years of the electric interurban Chicago, North Shore and Milwaukee about as well as anyone did. He made a few visits in the 1950s but near the end, he hammered at it intensely for about a year and a half until the line closed down in January of 1963. He logged more than 30 days of shooting the North Shore in that period. So like the sign says in the Milwaukee terminal, let's head to the trains. This is one of John's first North Shore shots showing the Milwaukee terminal in February of 1956. Those are regular trains on the left and right with one of the streamlined electro liners in the middle. The Hotel Schrader in the distance there is still a hotel. These days it's the Hilton Milwaukee City Center and fittingly the NRHS had its national convention there this past August. Here's the view looking the other way five and a half years later on September 25th, 1961 with an outbound electro liner passing an inbound local train in the middle of the intersection of 6th and St. Paul streets. 
Between the cars, the buildings, the billboards, and the workers, this is just a phenomenal record of time and place, one that's been changed irrevocably, especially with the construction of I-794, which now sails over this entire scene, almost nothing of which remains today. Now, this is something John tried many times. Driving behind a train in his car and shooting uh, through the streets in Milwaukee while shooting over the steering wheel. Well, the speeds here were slow. This makes this one a standout for me is that other photographer captured in the rear door amid a flurry of activity at the Milwaukee terminal. Immediately to the south, the North Shore tracks crossed the Menominee River and then ran down the middle of 6th and then 5th streets through Milwaukee's south side neighborhoods. For this view of an electroliner, John looks south down 6th Street near the intersection with West Virginia Street. Uh, Bashel's on the left is now a Mexican restaurant called Conejito's Place. Then it was a bar run by Slovenian Joseph Bashel, whose son, Louis Bashel, was a noted polka musician on the accordion. He's actually in the Wisconsin Polka Hall of Fame. And we do have one of those here. <laughs> uh, I'm sure the sounds of polka frequently greeted those North Shore trains passing Joe Bashel's. Here's another Milwaukee street scene from a little further south. This one taken on a rainy September night as a North Shore train passes the Streamliner Cocktail Bar at the corner of 6th and National. And further south, the tracks jogged from 6th to 5th Street, where John stood on a late spring day in 1962 and made this perfect composition of a one-car Chicago local rolling south at the corner of Orchard. The 1879 tower of St. Stephen Lutheran Church dominates the background. It still stands, as do the houses on the left, but everything else on the right side of this image is gone, torn down to make room for I-94. And now south of the street running in Milwaukee, the North Shore crossed the Milwaukee Roads main line on this truss bridge. It was a favorite location for John with the high embankment providing an ideal setting for dramatic shots. And by now it should be no surprise that he looked straight into, this, to, into the sun for this view of an electroliner flying by on March 11th, 1962. A few months later, he was back and made this pan shot of a northbound electroliner speeding into Milwaukee. Now, the electroliners had onboard lounge service and John took advantage of that frequently, photographing all the while. This view shows the bartender and a few passengers and John made a point of photographing the people of the North Shore up and down its system. Those people included a number of sailors. Those North Shore trains stopped right outside the Great Lakes Naval Station in North Chicago. This platform view in Milwaukee shows a group of them lugging their sea bags aboard an electroliner for a trip south back to base. John frequently photographed sailors on the North Shore, and those shots have special meaning for me. My grandfather went through boot camp at Great Lakes after he enlisted in the Navy in 1943. Let's look at a few more people of the North Shore. This is a motorman on a local train in the fall of 1962. And here's a, a great view of a tower operator from the inside. And note how John perfectly framed an approaching train through the window next to the Canada Dry Clock. I believe this is Ryan Tower, uh, located south of Milwaukee in Oak Creek, where the North Shore crossed the Chicago and Northwestern at grade. Uh, further south, across the state line now, John made a wonderful series of photographs showing freight operations at Rondout in the warm light of a late spring evening. And I just love the expressions here, the train crew hanging off the steeple cab electric. And here's another shot from the same day. And here's John flexing his muscles for composition again with this creative take on a Skokie Valley line station framed by the cross, brace, the cross braces from the overhead electric wires. Now on the south end of the system, North Shore trains ran on the loop in downtown Chicago, and John braved the heavy traffic on South Wabash for this superb view of an electroliner turning the corner on the East Van Buren Street in 1962, long before the L was extended south from here. And of course, he kept photographing the workers. And this is a station stop on the loop with a perfect reflection of this conductor in the doorway. Now, one more for the loop, or actually just north of it, but still on the L. John captured this rainy November view of an electroliner meeting a CTA train at the intersection of Ohio and Franklin Streets. And here's one of those great detail shots that only someone like John Gruber would think to take. 
framing up an electro liner through a crumbling concrete wall. The end of the North Shore was drawing near at this point, and John's photograph speaks to that. There was still some glory before the end, though. Uh, fresh snow on the night of January 11th, 1963, had John trackside the following day for some evocative views of winter railroading in the upper Midwest. I haven't had the chance to pin down the exact location of these two shots, but I just love the blowing snow and the high contrast of the low winter light. And that brings us to the last day. Adrian already showed you this shot. And here's a wider view of the same scene aboard the last run of an Electra liner. The atmosphere in the lounge car here looks pretty energetic. But the ticket window in Milwaukee reveals a far more somber scene. The agent had posted a hand-drawn last day sign, and his expression says it all. John stayed to the bitter end, counting down the final hours in the waiting room as out on the line the last trains ran off their final miles. The clock on the wall at, uh, at left reads 10.30 p.m. here on January 20th, 1963. John took this shot in the wee hours of January 21st, and it shows one of the last trains, if not the very last one. It's all gone now, but thanks to John, we have these pictures. He did a cover story for trains about the North Shore, and while he lamented its loss for the rest of his life, he kept right on shooting. And in 1964, he landed an assignment big enough and grand enough to match his talents and ambitions. With full credentials from Trains Magazine and full cooperation from the railroads, he set his sights on Chicago Union Station. He made at least three two-day visits in the summer of 1964, shooting heavily and proving himself once again to be the right photographer for the right subject at the right time. We we'll conclude today with a few of my favorite views of his Union Station assignment. He set the scene with this shot, looking west on Adam Street from the middle of the south branch of the Chicago River, and I can almost feel the humidity of this sultry July day. We'll start from the outside and work our way in. This view looks north from Randolph, with Milwaukee Road trains below and the Lake Street L crossing above in the distance. On the other end of the station, John went down to track level at Harrison Street Tower, where he caught two Burlington trains blasting out of the station and through the puzzle switches. Today, the post office covers all these tracks. John went inside the tower at Harrison Street to show the men who controlled all the train movements here and note yet again another deft composition with the nose of a Burlington E unit framed in the window next to the operator's face. On another day, John pulled back to show even more of the tower interior and he also got up close to emphasize that mess of track on the schematic diagram and all those interlocking levers that controlled the switches and signals. Back in the station itself, John went down to track level for dozens of views, including this one of a Burlington locomotive and baggage handlers moving cars on the platform. Now, as always, John emphasized the workers, including this porter standing next to a Milwaukee Road train the steam from the heating lines creates eerie silhouettes down the platform. And this powerful portrait of a tired looking switchman on the platform. In stark contrast to that last scene, here a couple walks hand in hand down the platforms as Burlington switchers work the south end of the station. Hard work and heartfelt moments, John captured them all. Yet for all his insider perspectives that took you behind the scenes of Union Station, it's this shot from the very public entrance off Canal Street that I think best embodies John's photography of the North American Railroad capital. Morning sun casts long shadows as a nun walks between the columns. Trains editor Dave Morgan ran this photograph as a full page in the magazine with a simple and poignant caption, it could be a cathedral. Indeed it could. But then at this point, I've come to think that almost anything could take on that level of grandeur when viewed through the lenses of John Gruber. In conclusion, I'd like to return briefly to this slide. We're replaced now with a, a rare self-portrait of John in a, a pretty reflective uh, Volkswagen hubcap. And consider briefly uh, this era and these subjects. We know that a lot of railroad photographers stopped shooting after steam ended in the 1950s, but John was just getting started. 
The photographers, we've, the photographs that we've just seen are ample evidence that the ravage of the early 60s still offered a lot of visual interest. And we see that in our other collections too. With the changes and losses continued, within a decade, everything on this list either changed profoundly or ended altogether. In John's hometown of Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago and Northwestern passenger trains had stopped running in 1963, and the Milwaukee Road followed eight years later. On the Duluth and Northeastern, regular steam operations ended in 1964. On the Burlington, Louis Mink replaced Harry Murphy as president in 1965, and Mink promptly ended the steam excursions. The 4960 lives on at the Grand Canyon, but the once mighty 5632 was scrapped in 1972. The Rio Grande shut down its line over Cumbres Pass in 1968, uh, but of course much of it was revived as a tourist operation three years later and remains today as the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad. The North Shore did not fare as well. Its tracks are gone and much of it is now a bike trail. Union Station is busier than ever today in Chicago, but in 1969 it's, it lost its distinctive concourse to make way for a modern office tower and two years later, Amtrak replaced all of the inner city passenger operations. So these six subjects, all of them changed greatly or gone completely before the end of the decade. John was the right photographer at the right time to preserve some portion of their visual legacy. He didn't always know these changes were coming, and with the exception of the Rio Grande, everything else was within a few hours of his home. He photographed the everyday operations that were right in front of him, and out of them, he made something extraordinary. And I think there's a lesson in that for all of us. Even today, there are still interesting railroad photographs to be made, not far from where any of us live. All we have to do is go out there and find them. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'll be happy to stay on and take questions. Uh, please send those to the Q&A feature. Uh, and thanks again to our other presenters and for all of you for tuning in. We really appreciate it and hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Scott. You know, it, it struck me, um, someone in the comments noted that this is a, a great selection of John's photograph, but really this is just a small simple of his work in general, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, we're only drawing from the first five years of his serious black and white decades. photography. There's, you know, another uh, five decades to go here. So can you can you remind everyone what the digitization status is of the Gruber collection? Yeah, so so we we're, we're working our way through this uh, sequentially, uh, going from oldest to newest, and I believe right now Abigail is uh, right near the end of 1965 and getting ready to start on 1966. And to date, uh, she and and her uh, predecessor, uh, John Walker, the two of them have digitized more than 15,000 of John's 35 millimeter and medium format negatives. Uh, so there's uh, plenty more where that came from, and uh, lots more that we haven't even seen yet that I'm excited to, to get through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, you can send those in for the Q&A. Um, Scott, I mean, John, he brought you into the center. He kind of found you and, and brought you in and essentially served as your mentor for many ways and probably um, for many years and probably many ways. I mean, what has it meant for you to go through his collection now a few years after his passing? I mean, it was, as I said at the beginning, it was really eye-opening and kind of revelatory for me because I just really wasn't familiar with that much of it. I mean, I knew tidbits of, of things that I'd seen in, in articles in Trains Magazine and occasionally stuff he'd feature at the center, but he was so focused on, on lifting up other photographers' work and other artists' work. And I mean, to, to great effect and to great benefit of the center, but I think sometimes, you know, in, uh, to, the, to the disservice of his own photography. Um, and, and so it's just been incredibly rewarding to get to see more of it. Um, and also for me, it's been interesting to, to see his, his working methodologies come through. And that was is something I had a little bit of a sense for, but but to see you know how he really was a really focused project-based photographer. I mean, I I think about Duluth in particular and all of the fascinating railroading on the Iron Ore Range up there, um, and yet John saw this opportunity with the Duluth and Northeastern to rather than you know make sort of a broad overview of Duluth railroading, he picked this one little subject where he had great access, and he just went as deep as he possibly could. And I you see that do him him do that again and again in his work. I mean more. Recently here, he shot the Green Bay and Western in its final years of operation. He did that on the North Shore, on the uh, Union Station. I mean, that was something that he really valued was 
you're getting a chance to, to photograph intimately uh, and take photographs that you know incorporated the workers and the passengers and the people. And you do that by building up those relationships and by going back over time and by focusing your efforts on on small places where you know you can get to know the people there and they can get to know and trust you. And that you know really led to some tremendous photographic opportunities that, that you wouldn't have had if you'd you know tried to take a more comprehensive approach. Yeah, and I'm sure we're all going to look forward to seeing what other gems slowly start to come out as we continue to go through his collection. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, yeah, more from more from what we've already done too. Just you know, for uh, for lack of time and desire to maintain some sort of a narrative unity, we had to kind of limit things today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll be doing more projects with John's work in the future. Yeah, it will definitely be, you know, as we start to publish more books, this will, this will definitely be one, uh, yeah, I think Jeff and I both hope to make uh, that this will be the, uh, the monograph of all monographs within, within railroad photography, and then one I know I'm excited to work on in the, in the, uh, in the years ahead. Yeah. Great. Um, well, no, no questions have come in. I mean, we are over time, so I think it's well, time to wrap up to that. Uh, the day. I want to thank all of our presenters, Jen, Stacy, and, and Scott for jumping in at the last minute with an absolute fantastic presentation. Um, and I want to thank uh, Todd and Jeff for joining in as well with some great questions for our presenters as well as um, finding our presenters. Both of them were instrumental in, in bringing them into the fold. Um, and I also want to thank our audience for joining us on a, at least here in Madison, a pretty dreary day, um, but maybe it's sunny in other places <laughs> across the country. Um, so a reminder, we are recording today's presentation and that will be available on our YouTube page early next week. I'll just drop that link in the chat right now. Um, it's youtube.com slash rail photo art. And you can learn more about all of the center's activities on our website and our social media channels. Um, we're on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Flickr, uh, what else? Instagram, and everything is at <laughs> Rail Photo. Um, and you can also find more on our website here. Um, and, and thank you, Haley, for all of your organization. You're here. Okay, uh, any final words from you, Scott? Uh, well, just a great thanks to everyone for uh, for tuning in today. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, and yeah, just to echo H Haley's uh, words of thanks to everyone and, and Todd's words of thanks to you, Haley. Thanks for, for all your great work to make our presentations and exhibitions run so smoothly. We really benefit from it. Thanks. My pleasure. <laughs> and it was, it right. was great fun to jump in here with John's work and, and just a wonderful opportunity to, to share it and uh, look forward to doing more of that. Mm -hmm.